getting on to tonight's discussion, um, tonight we'll be talking about the issue of justification, whether it's by uh, faith alone. This was one of the five solas of the Reformation that uh, the gentleman in Germany and later on in uh, Switzerland and France said that the Catholic Church is adding on to the gospel. They say that um, justification is by faith alone, but the Catholic Church is adding a whole bunch of stuff onto there. The Catholic Church said, well, actually, no, we're not adding things on there. In fact, you're taking away things that are very essential to uh, what it means to be justified by faith. Um, most of you are probably cringing at that description because I'm not very well versed in this. But fortunately, we have Colin and Aaron. Uh, Colin will be representing our Protestant perspective, and then Aaron will be presenting our uh, Catholic position. So, Colin, uh, I'd like to start off with you. Uh, would you mind just introducing yourself and what, what you're doing here at AM? Yeah, um, I am a super senior urban and regional planning major. Um, I'll be graduating in December and I'll be commissioning into the Army, hopefully as a chaplain. We'll see in November, find out if that's the case. And then uh, I absolutely love apologetics. I've had the privilege of being part of Ratio Christi for uh, one semester now, well, I guess half a semester now. And um, yeah, I have been involved in a lot of different uh, sort of religious organizations on campus, namely the Agnostic Atheist Student Group, which uh, was has since, I guess, reformed into something else now. And um, yeah, I was in the Corps for four years, so I know what it's like to be in this get up. And uh, yeah, that's about it for me. I see. And as many people are apt to point out, there are several thousand different versions and flavors of Protestantism. Uh, so where would you fit on the spectrum? Yeah. So um, specifically, I would consider myself to be a 1689 London Baptist confessional. Um, I am very adamant about the uh, authority of Scripture uh, as the ultimate rule of faith. Um, as we discussed last week, if you're here, um, and I guess uh, Trent's views kind of represented mine there, and um, I adhere strictly to the uh, 1689 London Baptist Confession, uh, which I believe is an excellent sum summarization of what Scripture teaches empirically. So, all right, all right, um, and Aaron, um, what exactly do you do here at A&M besides being in this get up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so obviously I'm in the Corps of Cadets. I'm the commanding officer of Company G1. Uh, I'm a Navy scholarship student, so here in May I'll be commissioning into the Navy as a student naval aviator uh, and going to Pensacola, Florida for flight training. Um, I am also involved, I was involved with Impact, um, transition out of that now that I'm a senior and I'm going to graduate, and then uh, was going to be a breakaway volunteer, but hit a few hiccups uh, recently with, with some theological viewpoints, but... <laughs> Yeah, I see. And uh, here's my joke. Um, what denomination of Catholic are you? <laughs> yeah, so uh, just my background, actually, uh, in terms of theology and, and whatnot, I used to be a Reformed Protestant up until some point this year, made the switch, uh, decided, felt uh, that I was being called over to the Catholic Church. Um, maybe it was preordained, if you will. Uh, and... <clears throat> So now that, now that I'm over on the Catholic side, you know, I don't want to say that I'm a liberal or a conservative Catholic or anything like that. You know, I think that cat, you, if you're a Catholic, you're a Catholic. You know, you're part of the universal church, and, and that's, that's what I think is important. So I hold to the teachings of the Catholic Church passed down uh, from the time of Jesus till now, 2,000 years later. All right, cool. So um, I'd like to start off with probably the staple verse quoted by Protestants on this issue, Ephesians 2.8, uh, where Paul is uh, speaking to the church at Ephesus, talking about how they were once uh, dead in their trespasses and sins. But then he says, by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And this is the staple verse for what's called sola fide, or justification by faith alone. Um, so Colin, as our Protestant, would you mind spelling out first what does justification mean, and then what is the difference between why the specification faith alone? Mm -hmm. Right. So, justification, um, Protestants believe, and uh, particularly Reformed ones believe that it is a legal declaration on the part of God that actually effectually makes you uh, righteous. Um, and so, what that to expound on what that means essentially is that, um, of course, you are born a sinner, right? Um, by nature, you're a child of wrath, and um, all everything you do up until the point that you are converted to a Christian is essentially sin, right? Um, 
at that point of conversion, um, you have uh, been given faith uh, in God, right? And God actually takes that faith and uses it to uh, kind of implant you into the, the family of God, in, in which case you are actually grafted in, right, as, as Jesus t- uh, speaks about. And um, you die with Christ, which basically makes you, right, as, as Christ died on the cross, that his blood actually cleanses you and makes you like Adam was, essentially sinless. But that's actually not enough completely to get you into heaven. Um, you need to actually be righteous in order to dwell in the presence of God. And so what God does then is he imputes the actual righteousness of Christ himself um, to you, right? And, and, and robes you in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, who lived a completely sinless life. And therefore, you actually have the merit of Christ enshrouding you on Judgment Day, which allows you to enter into heaven uh, unscathed. And so that's essentially what God does through the act of justification is he actually declares you just and then um, proceeds to glorify you. I don't know if you're familiar, if any of you are familiar with the concept of the golden chain of redemption, it's a very big deal in, uh, in Reformed theology. And essentially that's like justification is like after you've been uh, given faith, essentially. It's like midway through the chain. I see. And... So that, that's a pretty good description there of, of, of justification. Um, and then the faith part, how exactly, it, it sounds like you're saying that God gives you the faith. It's not really an action on, on the individual, or mm-hmm. how, what exactly is faith in, right. in this context? Right, absolutely, and that's a great question. Um, so uh, in Reformed theology, uh, we believe that God actually uh, uses the Holy Spirit in you to grant you faith and repentance. That faith and repentance are actually gifts from God, and we believe that because it's taught by Scripture. Um, now, essentially, the, the way, the, I guess the reason why that's important is because um, God, of course, if you're familiar with Reformed people, we're a bunch of Calvinists, and uh, a, lot of people, a lot of people don't like us for that, but that's okay. Um, basically, God, um, God is the one who acts on you, right, and sends his Holy Spirit to actually change your nature, right, um, and because he does that, he's then able to um, grant, like, his changing of your nature allows you to be in a positive position to have faith in God. He uh, removes the blinders of sin and actually allows you to see who God is, like, for what he is as the God of the universe, um, and then is able, then you see who he is and you respond in faith, um, but that you're only an allow, uh, basically able to respond in faith because God allowed it to happen. I see. Um, yeah, so. some, some of that may be a little bit outside of, of our, right, our right, target right. discussion. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Which, plug, we will be going to a restaurant afterwards to discuss this further, if any of you would like to join. Um, so on, on that topic of faith there, uh, it seems like you go through all this process of, of um, regeneration, which we won't touch that one, uh, big landmine there, but <laughs> yeah. Um, but once you get to that point of response in faith, though, what, what is the difference between just response in faith and faith alone? Like, what's that qual- qualifier right. there? Right, so, um, and I, of course, Aaron's probably going to expound on this and clarify, um, but it's, your act of faith is um, essentially the sole basis upon which God declares you justified. Um, there is no other merit upon you. There is no action or any sort of uh, thought or belief or anything that you could have done that made you justified before God. It is only His, uh, only on the basis of your f- having faith alone that you are justified bo- before God. It is not because of your participation in sacraments. It is not because of any meritorious or uh, pleasing acts that you have performed. And it is not because of any sort of uh, understanding that you might have. It is only because of the faith that you have in Christ for the forgiveness of sins. That is the sole basis upon which you are, you are justified before God. Uh, as I think Aaron will point out, is a, I guess a little bit different. He might, he might actually, I know a lot of Catholics try to say that they agree with that, but uh, we'll see. Well, let's, let's find see. out. Let's so find Aaron, out, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Colin's... Uh, definition there of justification by faith alone. He says the justification is a legal declaration by God that is based solely on an individual's confidence in Jesus Christ. Um, that's more or less the process of view. Where, where would you say that you agree or disagree on that view? I agree uh, with actually a lot of what 
Colin said, believe it or not, um, and and so does the Catholic Church. And you know, first I want to the one thing I want to say is you know, I am just a fallible human being. I am not the infallible Catholic Church, and we had that discussion last <laughs> week. But um, so if I say something that maybe isn't in, entirely, you know, in line with what's in this book or in this book, you know, that's my fault, not not the Catholic Church's fault, so don't necessarily take everything that I say as the gospel of Rome or uh, something like that. But um, I'd like to maybe just go ahead and start off with what does the Catholic Church say justification is? Uh, and uh, it's very helpful, you know, Colin has this, th- this little book right here, we've got this big one. Um, <laughs> But, uh, uh, you know, as, I, as we're going through, though, you know, a lot of the people in this room are, are Protestants, and there, there may be an aversion to Roman Catholicism. I know there was for me when I was a Protestant. And, and so something I'd like you all to consider as we're going through the rest of this evening is this uh, quote from Charles Hodge. If you're a Presbyterian, you might know who that is, uh, 19th century pastor. Uh, was at Princeton as I believe their president. And so he said, speaking on Catholicism, he said, could he without renouncing the Bible say that the sincere belief of these doctrines would not secure eternal life? Can any man take it upon himself in the sight of God to assert there is not truth enough in the above summary to save the soul? If not, then a society professing that creed professes the true religion in the sense stated above. So the big thing is we're going through, you know, I want to just help everyone understand, you know, what maybe is the position of the Roman Catholic Church. I think we're majority Protestant in here. And then Colin, for those who are Catholic, can maybe help us clarify what is what is the more Protestant position. But are we justified by faith alone, sola fide? Yes, but also no. And you'll discover uh, that's going to be a lot of what I say probably tonight. <laughs> So this is uh, another quote, a brief description of the justification of the sinner as being a translation from that state in which man is born a child of the first Adam to the state of grace and of the adoption of the sons of God through the second Adam, Jesus Christ our Savior. This translation, however, cannot, since the promulgation of the gospel, be effected except through the laver of regeneration or its desire, as it is written, unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. That's from the Council of Trent, session uh, 6, chapter 4. So uh, that's kind of the official, you know, long definition of what do we believe justification is. In simple terms, justification is the grace of the Holy Spirit giving us the power, uh, enabling us to be cleansed from our sins and then communicating to us the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. So the the big thing there is the communicating the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And Colin talked about uh, imputed righteousness. Uh, The Catholic Church would talk about infused righteousness or infusion of of grace. Um, We don't believe necessarily that it's a legal declaration versus a complete and total declaration. for justification. In terms of what also Colin said, justification is maybe this this singular event that occurs along this chain he talked about. And it's this point, you have faith alone, you put your faith in Jesus Christ, and now you're justified before the Father, you're going to heaven. The Catholic Church, uh, as I believe the Methodist Church to a certain extent holds this, this opinion, is that justification is a lifelong process. And so we don't have a singular moment in time where we say you have been justified. If you were to, uh, you know, after this moment in time, any time after that you die, you go to heaven. No, we say it's a lifelong process. Justification, sanctification, we'll probably talk about those a little bit more later, are intertwined and, and connected. And so the day that you're justified is the day that you stand before the Father in heaven. And I believe that St. Paul backs that up too, but um, we'll get into all of that a little bit later. All right. And as for this tricky word, alone here, so a a lot of what you said there, and I I have the quote from Trent here, um, we're justified by faith, but they leave off the alone. So what's the quibble with the alone thing? Yeah, so funny, fun fun story. Um, The only time you see faith alone, faith and alone, right after that listed in the Bible is actually in James uh, when it says that, um, you know, he's talking about you're not— uh, faith alone or faith apart from works is dead, you know, that that part, James chapter 2. Um, so are we justified by faith? Yes. Uh, but as Trent also said, 
We're justified by faith because faith is the beginning of human salvation, the foundation and root of all justification without which it is impossible to please God. However, when we talk about faith, we don't add this alone component to it because we do believe it is faith and works that contribute to this process of justification. And so while Trent says very clearly it's the foundation and root of all justification, it does not say that it is the sole cause of justification. And so over the course of one's lifetime, uh, think of it, initial justification. If, I'm, if we're going to use faith alone at all, it's going to be initial justification. When, when you first believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and accept him as your Lord and Savior, you're initially justified. But then it's a lifelong process of progressive justification, if you will. And that might sound more like sanctification to, to the Protestant. I see. So, Colin, if you would kind of come back on this and, and maybe tease out from the, the Protestant perspective, um, it sounds like what, what Aaron has here is these ideas of justification and sanctification are more or less blended, um, but he says that maybe the Protestant perspective kind of has those as two separate separate categories. So would you mind going into... Yeah, more yeah, absolutely. There? And um, yeah, Aaron's absolutely right. Um, it's for In the Protestant view, um, justification is... Uh, followed by sanctification, right? Um, so justification in the Protestant view being a legal declaration of God, it's not an act, not actually, shall we say, uh, effectual. You know, you're not like actually just at that point in time. Instead, what then happens is the process of sanctif- sanctification in which you are progressively to be made more like Christ throughout the course of your life. Um, so, like, I know if you're familiar with um, James 1, if you're familiar with Ephesians, uh, the or latter part of Ephesians, familiar with, uh, I believe, the uh, sixth chapter of 1 Corinthians, there you see this kind of process of, of Paul talking about um, us being made to, made to be in the image of Christ through trials and tribulations and uh, being sanctified um, through uh, suffering and different things like that. And also uh, the spiritual disciplines being sanctified through those. Um, so, like, I mean, Aaron and I would both agree a person becomes more like Christ when they pray or when they submit to the gospel or when they uh, repent and di- do those different things. Those are all, like, means of sanctification that God has ordained, right? Um, but those things do not actually make you just. Um, the only thing that makes you just is your faith in Christ. And so God uses your faith in Christ, makes a legal declaration, and then you spend the rest of your life be- becoming more like Christ. Um, and then when you arrive in heaven, you're, you know, you're glorified. And then all, all of, uh, well, we won't get an eschatology. But yeah, uh, probably a lot of you are familiar with that already. So... Yeah, lots of um, landmines. Lots we're of <laughs> yeah, today. we can. Oh man, yeah. Ooh, <laughs> yeah. Boy. So, yeah, but, yeah. so Aaron brought up something interesting. Mm-hmm. The only time faith alone appear, the phrase faith alone appears mm-hmm. in this uh, holy writ mm-hmm. would be in James chapter two. Right. And I'll just read it here. Um, and the scripture was fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. And I quote: "You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone." QED. QED. <laughs> so, yeah. so where where my Aaron? Well, what would you be? Uh, what what interpretation would you use to to understand what this is saying? Um, right. On on this view. Right. So I think it's Im- important to note, especially when talking about um, James. The I mean, if I, and this is something that Aaron and I have actually talked about extensively, but the historical grammatical uh, um, method of interpreting interpreting the script the scriptures. So if you're familiar with what James. Um, is talking about like throughout the entire book of James, as well as what his predecessors and the apostles uh, already believed, then it would be very difficult to, from from my perspective, argue that J- what James is actually saying um, is, yeah, you need works to be justified. Um, in fact, there's multiple other biblical translations um, and multiple, like if you go back and read the, the Greek rendering of the UBS uh, 25th edition, um, it renders that text a little bit differently, and and saying that, you know, that that particular translation is is not um, widely agreed upon as the best one. Um, so, that being said, um, I would also point to uh, Romans chapter four as as a uh, a good like hermeneutical balance with that particular text, um, and I'll read from Romans four, there's four one basically. Um, 
What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not, be, but not before God. For what does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as are his due. And those, and the one, to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. So I think that there's a very uh, important matter of harmonizing these two texts. And I, th- and I do think in this particular instance, uh, as many of the reformers have, have gone before me and said, um, the way you harmonize these two texts is actually by saying that works are a necessary outflow of justification, are a necessary evidence of the process of sanctification. So if you are being justified, you will have good works. Like there's no separation between the two. In fact, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says, how do you tell a fake Christian? Basically, you look at their life, and if there's no good works, probably a fake Christian, right? right? right. Um, Depart from me, workers of lawlessness, and so on and so forth. So um, basically, the only thing, I would say one of the big, like, if you're going to, like, zoom back and look at the big picture, the big way we see this differently, perhaps, is that um, the Reformed view is that uh, you're justified by faith, and then your good works flow uh, definitely. And then um, the Catholic position would probably be something closer to um, the Lord leads you into these like good works, and then you're spending the rest of your life being justified um, and getting infused with grace, mm-hmm. um, so long as you don't commit mortal sins and so on. Yeah, so yeah, for sure. So, so Aaron has Collins' mental gymnastics saved him from <laughs> the smackdown of James chapter two. Not really. No, <laughs> we had we had this conversation over uh, the summer about James, and I strongly disagree with where he comes from with his interpretation of the James, but that gets into some hermeneutics, and don't necessarily, that's not the scope of this conversation, um, because uh, he, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Colin believes that James is talking to people who uh, would already be saved and Therefore, he's he's saying, you know, if you don't have works, you never really were saved. It's, that's kind of where you're coming from. Right. Um, and I kind of disagree with, with that interpretation of, of that. Um, but that gets into the historical critical method and some other things, which we don't have time to do right now. <laughs> um, Unfortunately. But uh, one thing I want to make clear as from the Catholic position, because I think there's a common misconception among uh, Protestants especially about not just the Catholics, but maybe the Greek Orthodox and, and the Coptic Christians in Egypt, um, is you, you hear, uh, where is it? I have all my Trank quotes right here. Um, <laughs> you hear the uh, Canon 9 from the Council of Trent, which says, if anyone says that the sinner is justified by faith alone, meaning that nothing else is required to cooperate in order to obtain the grace of justification, and that it is in not any way necessary that he be prepared and and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. So a lot of people know that one. They know, oh, there's this long list of anathemas from the Council of Trent, and if you believe in faith alone, you're expelled from the church, you're damned to hell. That one's not true. Anathema is part of an ecclesiastical code that was actually removed in 1984, but that's another conversation. Um, Fallible, huh? uh, <laughs> that, that being said, one thing that people don't realize, in the same council, in the same list of anathemas, in Canon 1, Trent also said, if anyone says that man can be justified before God by his own works, whether done by his own natural powers or through the teaching of the law, without the divine grace through Jesus Christ, let him be anathema. So I think what's important for everyone to understand here is, uh, yes, we believe it is faith and works. We don't believe it is faith or works. Yeah, um, so the faith alone being the Protestant position, but the Catholic position is not works alone. It's it's this, uh, there has to be both of them. And we firmly believe that faith comes before the works. And Colin talked about, um, you know, he talked a lot about, more about this I- imputed righteousness and whatnot. Um, you know, a, a verse that I would go to for that is Romans 5.19, um, where Paul talks about, uh, you know, you will be made righteous. And he's, He's saying, you know, there's other scriptural texts, but that's the one we're going to go to right now. He says, you're, being, you're going to be made righteous, so you're not, uh, it's not just this legal declaration. You're literally being made righteous. And, and so that's what we believe uh, with justification is 
God has literally made you righteous through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So it's not just this legal declaration, but you, you yourself have become righteous. And um, there are things, you know, that can happen. To, you fall out of this state of grace and some other things, but another conversation as well. I would like to make a, on the topic of Paul and justification, which, by the way, plug, N.T. Wright has a book that's a thousand pages long on this. Um, but I, I'd like to bring in Romans uh, chapter 2, verse 13, where the Apostle Paul says, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it is the doers of the law who will be justified. Uh, and it seems that this verse uh, is implying that Paul is making kind of a parallelism. He says, not righteous if you just hear the law, but justified if you do the law. And it almost seems like Paul is implying that justification and being right, actually being righteous are more or less the same. Uh, so first, Colin, um, I'd ask if you would uh, comment on that, especially in light of what you said about uh, Romans chapter 4. And then Aaron, um, would that be like an accurate understanding of, of, um, of, of kind of where you're coming from with this whole idea of justification is righteousness? I'll start with Aaron and then and okay. Yeah. Um, Do I need to reread it? No, no, no. <laughs> I've, I've, I've got it in front of me. Oh, okay. uh, I'd actually go back on that, though, to verse 6, even where it says, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. And then go all the way through 13. Um, I'd actually, because I think all of those together, um, maybe back 13 up a little bit more. Um, but I'm not entirely sure what your question was, exactly what you're asking. <laughs> um, so in here, the, the ver- I picked this verse because Paul is saying, hearers of the law are not righteous, but doers of the law are justified. So um, part of the discussion that we were having is whether or not justification is imputed righteousness or infused righteousness. In other words, are you actually made righteous or are you merely declared righteous? Um, and... So the question here is, in, in this verse, it appears that Paul is saying justification is actual righteousness. And not only that, but justification is through doing the law. Um, so the, this, uh, so would that be like an accurate summary of, of how you would interpret this verse? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, so then Colin, yeah. Yeah. So um, I, I, I tend to view this passage... Um, and I think this is, I'm not 100% sure if all Protestants or uh, at least Reformed people do view this passage this way. Uh, I'm pretty sure at least Presbyterians do, most Reformed Baptists do, but outside of that I'm not 100% sure. But I'll go ahead and um, I, I, be- I believe that this particular verse is speaking within the context of the universal moral law, right? The, the law that uh, God has written on the hearts of, of every man and woman. Um, moral and, law as distinguished from immoral law? or Well, moral law in the sense that um, there is like the Judaic law, right? Or, or uh, which is basically like you keep the law, all of the law, you go to heaven, right? Like those, the, the quintessential workspace salvation. Um, and I think he's refer- he's not referring to that type of, normally I feel like in scripture you have that sort of um, not justified by the law or not justified by works. You're, you have, you're, you have in view... Um, this sort of Judeo, or I guess Judy, what's the word? Uh, Judaism? Mosaic, maybe? Mosaic, yeah. Right. Mosaic concept of the um, Old Testament law in view, oh, okay. specifically, especially in books like Hebrews and, um, and the Gospel of Matthew, where, where you have the audience directly being mostly um, not Gentiles, right? Like mostly Jews are in view here. Um, however, I don't think that's what's in view in this particular case, because if you go back and read all of Romans chapter 1 and, and the first portion of Romans 2, what Paul's doing, and he's doing this in the first three chapters of Romans, he's actually building an argument for human sinfulness, right? Like when, when Paul seeks to lay out, essentially, and I think it's kind of funny because when he seeks to present an argument, like the most clear, concise, masterpiece of the gospel, he starts not with like, God loves you and you know, all that kind of stuff. He's basically like, everyone's going to hell. Every single person's going, like, that's basically what he's saying in Romans 1 and 2, uh, and, and 3 as well. And so um, there's this sense of, like, urgency, and there's this sense of, like, impending, like, you know, angst. Um, and I think if you read it through, what he's talking about is that, that t- type of unrighteousness that naturally comes from human nature, which is, you know, the whole children of wrath thing. And um, he's not talking about, like, works as opposed to that. He's just talking about um, the actual like evidences for faith, right? What I would call sancti- evidence for sanctification being occurred and perhaps evidence for prior justification. 
So I, I don't have any problem with this, this uh, taking the, the face value reading of this verse. I think. Okay, so yeah. so he's not saying that this the law that he has in mind is not mm-hmm. the uh, Mosaic Covenant laws of the Old Testament. Right. It's it's the uh, the law that's written on the heart as promised by by Joel, for example, right. that every human being knows not to kill people, mm-hmm. you know, to uh, love their neighbors themselves and things like that. Yeah. You know, there's more than just this passage in Romans. You know, I do think uh, there there are a lot of verses that back up works as being a part of justification. Um, and definitely an expectation, uh, which is, you know, the Reformed view. But Titus 3, 5 through 8, uh, Philippians 2, 12, 13, Romans 2, 6 through 13, and then the big one, you know, a lot of people go to James 2, 17 through 24. I, I do want to comment, going back to James, there's a guy named Paul Rainbow who's a New Testament professor. He's a Baptist who said, in vain do we search James 2, 14 through 26 for any statement of a casual relationship between faith and works or between righteousness and obedience. What jumps out from the material is a thrice stated avowal of the instrumentality of justification that is by works. And that, that guy's a Baptist, so he's, he's not um, a Catholic. <laughs> uh, that being said, going back to this whole, um, you know, what Zach was talking about, you know, when I was starting to first look into the Catholic Church from the perspective of being this reformed Calvinistic mindset of what Colin's talking about, you're justified, and then as an expectation, you know, works come from someone who's truly justified, but they are not what justifies you. I started to realize that uh, there are a lot of verses in the Bible that don't necessarily back that up, that back up the justification is a lifelong process. It's a past, present, and future thing, and I have a whole list of things we can talk after this, what verses those are. Um, But what really I think is is big to focus on is Colin saying, you know, there's definitely this connection. I think it's important to look at the history of the church in general. And as early as, uh, you know, I think it was 80, 90, um, you've got people talking about I've got so many pieces of paper up here. Uh, You've got people talking about, you know, this idea of justification comes by doing, by not just faith, but also by by works. And so we have this scriptural interpretation here that that the Protestants have. But I think it's important to know, you know, historically, what did the church believe for pretty much 1,500 years? Whether we're talking about, you know, the great church before the the, the schism in the 10 hundreds um, between the, the Catholics and the Orthodox. Uh, but what's interesting to see there is the Orthodox, the Catholics, and the Coptics all still have the same view of justification that, that you know, they, there is no discrepancy there. That didn't pop up till 1517. And so even, you know, we have Clement of Rome, um, who's writing a letter to the Corinthians in 8090, and he says, Let us therefore join with those to whom grace is given by God. Let us clothe ourselves in concord, being humble and self-controlled, keeping ourselves, yada, 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 being justified by works and not by words. Why was our father Abraham blessed? Was it not because of his deeds of justice and truth, which were wrought in faith? And, and so we see, you know, as early as 8090, this idea that um, you're justified by works and faith, you know, he mentions rotten faith in the same sentence, in the same paragraph that he's talking about uh, being justified by works. And so I think the Calvinistic perspective, John Calvin, um, Martin Luther, and some of these other guys, the ref- some of these more reformed theolo- theological ideas, they're absolutely correct in that a true, what does a true Christian look like? They look like somebody who has put their faith in Jesus Christ, and now they're doing good works. And so really at the end of the day, uh, the Catholic Christian looks the same as the Calvinist. The end result is someone with faith and good works. But I think historically and biblically that there is a much stronger argument to be made for it being a faith and works as opposed to just a faith alone. Good works, these are things that Christians are expected to do. We see Jesus talking about this in in the Gospels. Uh, But what I think is important to distinguish is that the church doesn't actually believe that those works in and of themselves necessarily come from man. Uh, we, we, the church believes, the Catholic church believes that those things are a result of grace being given to you uh, by the Holy Spirit. And so at the end of the day, these good works, I, I believe it was St. Augustine who said, when God crowns our merits, he's really crowning his. And what did he mean? You know, 
Augustine, Calvin quotes him a lot, Luther quotes him a lot, and at the end of the day, Augustine was much more a Catholic than he was a Lutheran or a Calvinist. And so what does that mean? It means that when we're doing these good deeds, these good works, and I think we would have the same definition of what good works exactly are, it's living this this out, this out. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, th those things all proceed from the grace of the Holy Spirit. So if there's one thing, you know, if there's there's three out of the five solas that the Catholic Church can get on board with, one of them is definitely sola gratia, grace alone. And and so it's through this this grace that we have these good works and we're living out our faith in, mm -hmm. in Jesus Christ. Yeah. So, so Colin, Aaron is painting a picture of a faith that's vibrant, committed, and has some fruit growing on off of it. Um, a lot of people would say that Protestants just have kind of this bare bones, you punch your ticket faith, you say the sinner's prayer impact, and then you go on <laughs> and never, never, never show any fruit. Um, and that's what faith alone is. Uh, so so um, how, how then would you distinguish this idea of uh, Aaron's view of faith that is producing works um, as opposed to just like this Protestant view of punch your ticket and move on. Right. So, um, yeah, I, if you, I think if you actually look at the majority of generally conservative uh, Christian scholarship, both, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Protestant Christian scholarship um, over the past, I'd say, 450 years, um, you won't find anything like this idea of uh, punch your ticket and go to heaven until about like 1967 uh, when free grace theology started being espoused from an, not a Reformed Baptist seminary um, in the southern part of the country. And so, Texas. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, so uh, what in that very concept of, of punch your ticket, you know, say, I believe, you know, pray the sinner's prayer, say like, I believe in Jesus. Um, is that for anyone who doesn't know what that's called, that's called free grace theology, right? The idea that as long as you have faith, you could be literally Hitler and you're still going to heaven. Um, and I, I think, I know every single Reformed person would categorically deny that as being even conceivably true from the pages of Scripture. Um, and I'm glad that my Catholic brothers and sisters do so as well. Um, but there are some dangerous Protestant heresies out there that, that embrace this idea. Um, and it's definitely something that I, I, uh, I mean, Aaron wrote an essay about, uh, about how wrong it was, and I, was, I thought it was really good. Um, so, but I do want to note two things that I think are important. Um, as first, that um, if you look at Matthew 7 in particular, uh, I know I mentioned it before, um, that is like, if anything, you know, uh, even, even your proclamation of faith in Jesus Christ means absolutely nothing. Um, like, that will not get you anywhere with God. Um, Jesus literally says that, um, you know, if you, there's going to be people who come on Judgment Day. They're going to see, like, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We emphatically pronounce Lord, Lord. You know, if you're familiar with Hebrew parallelism, that's just an, an emphatically. These are people who are, like, loudly pronouncing the name of Jesus and who are going to come on Judgment Day. And Jesus is going to say to them, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Right? I never knew you. And so, um, for me that causes me to ask the question, well, what, what are these texts about, um, about works mean, right? Because works is really, you know, the question you asked about. And I think that the categorical difference between the Protestant and Catholic view would be the, this viewing them as either descriptive or prescriptive, mm -hmm. right? Like you see all the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, a Catholic looks at that and says, wow, he's, I should do all those things, right? That's, that's prescriptive for me to do all those things. And I would say yes to an extent, but if you've just read Romans 1 through 3, you know that those things are literally impossible for you to do apart from the grace of God being supplied to you, right? Because what does Paul say about, about every human being indiscriminately um, that's under sin? Uh, it says both Jews and Greeks are under sin as it is written, and this is Romans 3, uh, 3, 10 through uh, 13. None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, no, not even one. Their throat is an open, ga open grave, and their tongues uh, are used to deceive. And mm. so like, he's describing literally every human being outside of Christ. When he's, That's right. an indiscriminate statement. That applies for me and for Aaron and you know, everyone in this room um, prior you know, being outside of the grace of Christ. Now, if you're inside the grace of Christ, obviously you've been given a new nature. Um, I'm not sure if we'd agree with that on entirely theologically, but I believe Landline. we've been, been given a new nature. Yeah, <laughs> and so yeah. that new nature is what allows us to actually 
adhere to those works. Like it is because of the action of God salvifically acting in us that we're able to uh, co- uh, live out these good works, that we're able to display the fruits of the Spirit. That's why they're called the fruits of the right. Spirit and not the fruits of the obedient dude. For right? Sure. They're, they're the fruits of the Holy Spirit of God actually displaying his presence and glorifying himself through you, you broken earthly vessel. Right? Okay. So that's what I think is, is really being talked about. In All right. Um, so I'm going to ask Aaron one more question. And uh, while he's talking, if you all have any questions, just form an orderly um, line going down this way. And again, I reiterate, We've already heard 45 minutes. We don't need to hear 45 more. Uh, <laughs> so if, um, if you would, just if you have questions, go ahead and uh, start lining up. Um, so Aaron, Colin says here that, uh, you know, the Protestant view is not this punch your ticket thing, works are involved, uh, but the distinction is that these works do not merit anything. Um, and I think that that may be, uh, would that be accurate to say that, that that's a more uh, definitive, um, or that's a more... Um, descriptive way of speaking about it, to say that you can't merit your faith, but maybe, or sorry, merit your justification, but perhaps you could work for it or something to that effect. Right. Um, we, in, in Catholic circles, you know, we talk about the faith, but we do, yes, you merit, you are justified on your merit, but that goes back to when God crowns your merits, he's really crowning his. Uh, but I, I really, you know, with everything Colin said, want to go back to, I hopefully, hopefully everybody can see there's a very, very close line between what Colin is talking about in a lot of respects and what the Catholic perspective is on on this idea of, of justification, faith, and, and good works. Um, you know, he says they play no part of salvation, no part of justification. The Catholics say they do. And so the, the big thing, I think, when I looked at church history, one of the things that made me led me to become a Catholic was the history of the church, particularly the Reformation, is when you look at the theology that came out of the Reformation, you see it's very, very close to the Catholic Church, to Catholicism, and it leads one to question, given the historical uh, interpretation of the text, given the historical interpretation of Scripture throughout the years, for almost 1,500 years, it, it leads one to really question, did we change, did Protestants change their theology simply because they had a disagreement with the guy who was sitting on his throne in Rome? Or was it because there was actually a problem here? Um, and you, if you look at the theology of the Reformers as well, it's actually not, the, the Protestant faith today is not the Protestant faith of 1517 by any stretch of the imagination, or 1545 or 1600 for that matter. It's, it's, you know, I know there's this always reforming or whatever. Semper reformer. Um, but, but, you know, the reformers themselves would not recognize, ref- even Calvin would not recognize reformed theology today. And so I think it's, you know, when we look at this topic, I don't think you can really have a discussion on it without looking at the history of the church. And so I would really encourage everybody moving out of here if you're interested more to to dive into the history and not just take what I say or what Colin says, but look up, you know, what people wrote for fifteen hundred years and then make your own conclusions on this topic. Yeah, if I if I may uh, add to that, I think that Aaron brings an extremely important point up and that is the the uh, you know, we don't we don't just have the Bible and we don't just have like the catechism and, and the confessions of faith and all those things. They're within the context of history and of time and people's lives and um, blood being spilled, you know, to preserve the pages of scripture and preserve these words and, and all that sort of thing. Um, I think what's important to remember also is that, and, and he's absolutely right, like Calvin would walk into like my church and be like, what the heck's going on here, right? There's a cross um, on the wall. Yeah, Heretics. yeah like, yeah, iconoclast, you know, like all kinds of stuff. And then, but I also think that, uh, Erasmus would walk into a Catholic church today and be like, what the heck's going on here? Um, I, I don't think there, I don't see like a huge distinction on that part. I think uh, as, I think as we have like uh, this concept of like progressive uh, revelation, as we plumb the depths of scripture and, and learn more, you know, as society changes, as, as what our means uh, and, and things that have, that we have available to us in our society change, the, the church is going to look different. And I think that's by design. I think it's a really, a really beautiful thing. But I also want to remember that Um, The Church Fathers wrote wonderful things, and you should all go read the Church Fathers. Like, please do. Highly encourage. I agree with Aaron. You should really go read them. Um, But I also think that you have to remember, a lot of the Church Fathers don't have, like, this. You know, they don't have um, 
scriptoriums or they had they don't even have like accesses to access to like solid uh, copies of the bible in their own language right um and so they they spent most of their time not talking about calvinism or arminianism or works based um righteousness and all that sort of stuff because they were trying to defend the deity of christ they're trying to defend the gospel itself, I think, amidst uh, Roman persecution, amidst the societal changes that were taking place. If you look, even like, especially like, look at the Dark Ages and, and look at the societal things that were happening in history. Um, they had a lot of other things on their plate other than mm. the uh, discussions that we get to sit in a really comfortable, safe room uh, with our, you know, access to unbelievable amount of resources and 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 talk about these things. I yeah. think we need to remember that's a huge. Uh, uh, it would be an anachronistic to say that, you know, that the the church fathers had access to the times that uh, yeah. types in, of things that we. In, yeah, in many ways, the the church stands on the shoulders of giants, um, particularly Augustine being one of the chief cornerstone of mm-hmm. the giants. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. uh, so with that, let's transition to some questions. Um, no one is in line. Uh, we'll just do. Oh, you're in line. Okay, go ahead. Colin talked too long. They sat down. Oh, sorry. <laughs> My bad. Uh, this is a question for Aaron. Uh, so you're saying the Catholic view of salvation is both the Holy Spirit's regeneration plus your works through uh, through the Holy Spirit. The the more reformed view is yes, it is possible for you to do good works before you're actually saved, but those uh, those good works do not have any. Uh, they they they're done through sin. You you're doing them through a more of a how is this about me kind of right. thing than they are about the glory of Christ. Um, but what you were saying uh, seemed to sound like it is impossible for somebody to do good works prior to their salvation. No, so um, we believe that you can still do good works, and we don't. The Catholic Church does not believe it's sin out of a, out of a sin, and that gets back to not back to, but into uh, the concept of what is exactly the fallen nature of man. On the reform side, you have this idea of total depravity, and, and that's why it gets into anything you've done, you know, was, was conceived from sin. And on the Catholic side, the Catholics say no, you know, man was made in the image of God, man is still in the image of God, and after the fall of Adam and Eve, it's a um, if you think of a mirror, it's a mirror with a lot of cracks in it and maybe some shards missing, but it's still a mirror. And so you're still it's you're still able to do good works. They're not out of a place of sin, but um, if you don't have the faith component, those works don't mean anything. So they're not necessarily sin, but they're not contributing to your justification if you don't have faith. I have a follow-up question. So if there's a person who's saved, there, there's a person who has been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, but does not show good works, would they be considered saved under Catholic view? No. No. Because, and I don't think under the Reformed <coughs> view either. Uh, That's correct. I, I don't think either view would, would say that person is saved, which is not a word that Catholics don't use saved a lot either. So. <laughs> hey, Colin and Aaron, thank you all first of all for uh, just for doing this. I think it's been helpful. Um, so uh, it seems to me that the most significant thing about this debate is what should be our attitude or frame of mind as we start a life seeking Jesus and as we live it out. Um, so my question could be phrased as, and I think mainly for um, Aaron, um, just for time's sake, um, does God accept a disciple of Jesus and adopt him or her as his child even when we stray away from him to some extent? And is our standing with God a gift from God that we've received and can rest in? Or will he only accept us if we can meet a certain standard of goodness from day to day? Uh, So, you know, at the end of the day, we talk about, there's a whole lot of stuff in here, uh, and I haven't, you know, quoted a lot of it. And, you know, I've quoted like this much, this much of it. (laughs) But, um, you know, in regards to that, Nothing we do, no matter how many good works we do, are ever going to enable us to meet a certain criteria to get into heaven without the faith component. Um, that being said, uh, the and I'm kind of blanking on exactly what your question was again. Um, 
another way I could phrase it is like, do we start from a position of God accepting us or does he accept us only if we meet a certain standard? Yeah. So no, we start, um, it, it is the Catholic position. I talked about, you know, <coughs> this idea of initial justification, which isn't necessarily something you'll see defined as like dogma of the Catholic church, but it's this idea of we, we first come to God through the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We don't go to God on our own. And I think that's very similar in, in, a lot of aspects um, to the reformed view there are some differences in how they view the grace aspect of that um, but you know it's it's not there's no bar we have to meet and you now I remember you talked about like losing you know is there something you could do maybe to fall away not not go? so it, there is no assurance of salvation within the Roman Catholic Church uh, and in some other you know Protestant denominations even and so one of the things you know, that we, in the Catholic Church, we didn't get into it. It's a whole nother discussion. There's this idea of moral and venial sin. And so there's these mortal sins that cut you off from the state of grace. And so th there's this idea of if you were to, say, murder somebody, that, and then after you murdered somebody, you're not repentant, you get hit by a bus, you're going straight to hell. You're not going to purgatory, you're not going to heaven, uh, you're going straight to hell. Even though maybe the whole rest of your life you had lived, um, this quote-unquote good life. In that moment, you cut yourself off and you were unrepentant. On the flip side, let's say you murder somebody at 9 a.m. At 12 p.m., you've repented of your sin. You're, you're, you're completely remorseful. At 3 p.m., you're going to go to confession, which is another topic, but and, and confess and get absolution, but you get hit by a bus at 2 p.m. and don't make it to confession. At that point, you're going to not probably heaven, but purgatory for a period of time. You're going to be in heaven eventually um, because you were repentant. And so that's where it gets into a little bit of you can lose, if you will, your salvation. Even though you once were justified, you might not always be justified. And if pressed, we would get Colin to admit that you can't know if you're part of the elect until the day you die. So, Colin, are we a part of the elect until the day we die? I think you absolutely can know <laughs> whether you're a part of the elect. I think um, mm, that's not what you said in a text message. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think that it, you can know whether or not you might. I can know whether or not I'm a part of the elect. Um, I can know that because of the evidences of the Holy Spirit in my life. Um, I know that if you look at, and I think many many Christians have this experience where they come to Christ and then their life completely does a 180. Right, you you hear like uh, people go to jail and like they you know they get their they get hear the gospel from perhaps the first time and then they like come out and they're like born again Christians and their life's completely different. Um, you hear about people who you know have these radical changes of, in their lives and their perspectives and all those sorts of things. And I think that's like a good evidence of what I've experienced in my own life is that I can I now do the things that Scripture says because I love Scripture and I have this love for for Christ Himself as a, as a person. Uh, in me, and like that love was never there before I knew who Jesus was, um, and I think that love is evidence of God's salvation, of something that I never deserved, something I never did, something I never merited in any way, but something that God did uh, because of his mercy and grace, um, and so that's kind of like where I would stand on that. I, I believe I can know, I can have assurance of my salvation um, but I'm not sure that uh, I can't know whether or not other people are saved. I can only uh, per perhaps guess or estimate right. at that regard. All right. Last question. If um, faith is, I mean, if being saved is ongoing over a lifetime, uh, what if your life is suddenly cut short, for example, the thief on the cross? Yeah, so, well, we see with, what, is the, what does Jesus say to the thief on the cross? He says, you know, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so we look at him and, you know, crucifixion was capital punishment in, in the Roman Empire. And so we call him the thief on the cross. We don't know what he did. You know, really, the Bible doesn't explicitly say what he did in the, in the process of that. So, you know, is it possible he murdered somebody in addition to stealing something? Yeah, maybe, possibly. But in any case, to be on the cross, he probably was not living a life of... of merit of good works and yet from maybe you're listening to me and you're saying well then that's a conundrum to the catholic because you have to have merit you have to have good works to be saved um, and that's where we get into this on the cross he turned his he 
accepted this grace that Jesus Christ offered him hanging next to him and said, I am putting my faith in you. I am turning to you as my Lord and Savior. And in that moment, he is justified. And the grace of the Holy Spirit washes over him and cleanses him of his sin. And he is able to then, you know, Jesus says, on this day you'll be with me in paradise. He's going to heaven. And so while there may not be good works in his life up to that point, who knows, maybe he was Hitler up until that point, he's going to heaven because in that moment he's been initially justified, if you will. Um, And then that also gets into some, you know, I can't say this without mentioning baptism because then I would be a heretic in in Mm -hmm. Catholicism, but that gets into some uh, concepts of baptism and the different types of baptism, and he had the desire at that point, and so he will be in in heaven. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but... Um, So we'll wrap up here. Uh, Aaron, if you would, just about 60 seconds, closing remarks, uh, wrap up the entire uh, 1,500-year history (laughs) of the Catholic (laughs) Church. Sounds yeah. easy. Mm-hmm. Um, so in about, you know, don't time me, but, uh, you know, what I really hope this, I hope this was helpful for both sides. Um, with the Protestants in the room, I would definitely encourage you all, like I said earlier, to go in and read the, the history of the church. Not just, you know, I know this is, this is great. This is one of the pillars of the Catholic Church says this is one of the pillars of our faith. Um, but go read the history. Look at, you know, how did the doctrines develop, if you will, and and where how did we get to where we are today? Um, and I would also encourage uh, the Catholics in the room to maybe take a look at what do our Protestant brothers and sisters, Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and some of these other guys over the years, what and the doctrines they developed, what do they believe? Because um, I can tell you it's been kind of a, a hard thing for me to deal with converting the Catholicism over the last few months and interacting with some of my Protestant brothers and sisters who are now of the opinion, oh, you're not a Christian, oh, you don't have this saving faith, um, et cetera. The, a whole deal that went on with impact um, and, and some other stuff that, that, that's there. And so I would just encourage everybody, you know, hopefully this dialogue was helpful. Hopefully everyone realizes maybe instead of being this wide gas, uh, chasm right here, you know, separating us. Maybe it's more like this, um, closer than we thought initially. It's still still a chasm, still a separation, but it's not as far as initially thought. I see. And uh, Colin, our representative from Geneva, what have you, what do you have to say in uh, summary? Um, well, I'll summarize briefly, but I'll just read a very short excerpt from this from the uh, chapter eleven of the sixteen eighty nine Reformed Baptist Confession. And that is, faith thus receiving and resting on Christ and his righteousness is the alone instrument of justification. Yet it is not alone in the person justified, but it is ever accompanied by all other saving graces and is no dead faith, but worketh by love. Um, and I think that's really a beautiful, um, a beautiful thing. And I think that's what highlights um, perhaps one of the differences between um, what, Rome, what Rome teaches and, and, what, um, and what Protestants believe, and that is that um, the what what the really the issue that we're talking about this evening um, is it goes down to the heart of the gospel. You know what defines the gospel? How is a person to be saved? Um, and so I think that while we work on a, and I think uh, we're working together with Protestants and I'm Catholics and working with Protestants more and more today on you know, hugely important issues like abortion and and um, and other social issues, um, legal things, and especially in the United States um, and and across the world. And I think. I'm deeply grateful to my Catholic uh, brothers and sisters who have uh, gone before me, uh, you know, and and done um, tremendous things in the faith. Uh, but I do think that the disagreements that we have um, are not, not perhaps, you know, as Aaron framed it, so tiny like this. I think it really is a quite a still a big chasm, and I think the only reason that we don't see that more uh, these days, uh, perhaps as we did in the Reformation, is because our understanding of those things is not perhaps what it once was. But um, that being said, I do think that um, it's been a very, very important discussion, uh, some, one that we should keep having. Um, and I, I encourage all my Protestant uh, friends to, to seech, uh, search and seek out. Uh, don't misunderstand and don't misrepresent uh, what the Church of Rome teaches because there's uh, a lot of edification and, and, uh, and really, really solid stuff to be found there. All right. With that, let's thank our speakers for tonight. <laughs>